Then they go down to the town of Thessalonica. And from there, we kind of got to see this picture of what was going on. Chapter 17 of Acts, we, we see that story play out. Things are going good. Everything's going great. Um, people are getting saved. They're only there three weeks. They're only there three weeks, guys. Imagine that. All your discipleship, everything you know about Jesus, you never heard the name of Jesus before, and all you know about him is you learn in three weeks. That's crazy. Um, and and they got to get everything into them that they're going to need to stand on their own. And the Jews of that town get mad and raise up a ruckus, another mob, just like what happened in Philippi, and, and they're getting, they get chased out of town. They go to Berea, same thing happens uh, 40 miles down south. Um, they get chased out of the town, and it's on repeat. They keep on sharing the gospel, and any time they share the gospel, follow me now, every time they share the gospel, there's opposition to the gospel. Imagine that. Amen? How many of you guys thought that when you became a Christian, everything would just be easy? Maybe you didn't say that out loud. Thanks, Rip. I'm glad you're honest. Yes, right? You think, oh, I'm doing the right thing, therefore things should be good. I should, everything should be great. Everything should work out for my good, right? How many of you, when you became a Christian, all of a sudden, you realized things actually got harder? Life got harder. Things got more difficult, right? Right, right. You had to say no to your flesh, right? People made fun of you. People left you out of the reindeer games, right? And Rudolph gets to sit off by himself. But guess what? You're going to lead Santa's sleigh tonight. I don't know where that came from. Let's keep moving. <laughs> Someone say, can't stop, won't stop. Every time they get beat up and chased out of town, they go and they preach again. You would think that they would learn their lesson and shut up and stop preaching the gospel. Amen. But someone said they can't stop until they won't stop. Amen. Then we got to verse 5 of chapter 1 in 1 Thessalonians. He says, our gospel, someone say gospel, did not come to you just in words, but in the power and in the Holy Spirit and with full Conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for whose sake? For your sake. The gospel is the word euangelion. Someone say euangelion. It's actually where we get the English word evangelism, euangelion. Um, it kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? Euangelion, and it's a Greek word, and it means good news or, or glad tidings. It's good news. Uh, what's, what's really interesting, guys, is that the word uh, gospel, euangelion, is always tied to a witness, someone to a message is always tied to the messenger. So the good news is the message of the gospel. We're going to talk about that in a second. But the gospel, just like your Bible, if it just sits on a shelf, it doesn't do any good. It's got to have someone to take that message off the shelf and share it, right? And that word is a witness. And we're going to cover this more because it's crazy. That, and that word is um, the word, the base word is like maratu or something like that. It's where we get the word martyr. And a witness is somebody who um, it stands on a judicial, on a, on a witness stand, and they, they proclaim what they have seen, whether, it's, whether they get beat up for it or, or they just proclaim the truth. They're witnesses. Did you know that also the word implore is the same root word as the word witness? So he's saying, I'm imploring you with the gospel. I'm, I'm witnessing about the gospel, about the truth of this message, of the life-saving message of Jesus Christ to you. I'm a witness of it. I've been impacted by it. I've been too posted by it. It's been hammered into me. I've seen it. I can't deny it. I'm witnessing it. Amen? So there's always, anytime the gospel is there, there's tied to it. Right next door is the witness. And he says this, that you know what kind of men we prove to be. So the gospel didn't just come in word, but in power and the Holy Spirit and full conviction right? And just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you, those two things are linked. The gospel, the message is very important, and the way in which we deliver it is also vital. Amen. Someone say, oh, we got one somewhere. So on January 1st, um, 1863, President Lincoln signed what we know as the Emancipation Proclamation. You guys remember this? That would free all slaves. Someone say, good news. But it would take two and a half years for that good news to make all the way to the southernmost tip of the United States in Galveston, Texas. It would take another two and a half years for all the slaves to be free. Isn't that crazy? On June 19th, 1865, General Gordon Granger stood on Texas soil and, and read to the people, the people of Texas are informed that the, in accordance with the proclamation of the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. Some will say all slaves are free. All slaves. And in 1979, it became a Texas holiday. And last year, Juneteenth became a national holiday. Amen. Amen. And it celebrates the moment when the last slaves at the very farthest reaches of Galveston, Texas, were finally 
finally freed, the last ones. And although the Emancipation Proclamation was signed into law in 1863, there were still slaves in 1865. They still hadn't received the good news. Someone say we're going somewhere. See, back then it took a long time for soldiers to march, a whole army of soldiers to march all the way from the north, all the way down to the south. They would have had to have marched hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles to get down to Galveston, so many miles per day. Those feet were probably sweaty and busted and messed up and bloody and blistered. Those boots were probably falling apart by the time they got down to the coast down there. But those feet were beautiful because they brought the message from the messenger, from the messenger down through the witnesses down to the very tip of Texas. Amen? What if I told you that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ announced the eternal emancipation proclamation? 2,000 years ago, Jesus stood on Calvary, nailed to a cross. He paid for our debt, and he says, now you go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news, that you are no longer slaves. See, Romans 6 says we are all slaves to sin. And then Jesus says in, in Luke 4 that, that he came to preach the gospel to proclaim liberty for the captives, for those who are in prison bars, to say, you're not a slave to sin anymore. Romans 8 says that the life of Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. You don't have to bow to sin. It is not your master anymore. You can walk away free. That's good news. Someone said, that's good news. And Romans 10 says that how beautiful are the feet of the people who preach the gospel of peace. Why? Because they bring glad tidings and good things. They bring glad tidings of good things. Think about those Union soldiers' beat up feet for a moment. And think about whenever you were a slave, you couldn't leave, and you saw those soldiers coming over the hill, and you saw those crazy feet. Now, what we might have seen as ugly, beaten, broken, if you look at my toes, oh, I don't like to take off my shoes. I hate foot washing ceremonies because I don't like my feet, but my feet bring the good news. Amen. Anyone who brings the good news, you're bringing the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Some will say they can't stop. They won't stop. But what if those soldiers got tired along the way? What if they said it's someone else's job? What if they said, you know what, I forget President Lincoln. I don't agree with him, so I'm not going to go and share this message with those people down there. They would still be slaves today. Someone had to go. Someone say, I'll go where they send me. I'll go where he sends me. I want you to think about the moment that you gave your life to Christ for a moment. I want you to think about that moment. Can you remember? Do you remember the moment when you said, yes, Lord, you walked the aisle. You said, I'm in. You were around a table and someone led you in that prayer. Or you were at an altar somewhere and you said yes to Jesus. Maybe your mom and dad prayed with you beside your bed. You remember that moment, everybody? You remember that moment, right? I want you to think about the person who brought you the gospel. I want you to think about the person who shared the good news with you and the story and they convinced you once and for all with that witness with that witness of their life, and they said, this is the truth, and you said, okay. I want you to think about them for a moment. Now close your eyes. I want you to think about their feet. Those feet brought that message to you. Brought to you by the feet of so-and-so. How beautiful are those feet? I want you to thank God for that person, because you wouldn't be sitting here tonight if they didn't. Go ahead, go ahead, pray. I want you to think about it. Maybe I don't know, maybe they're going through something tonight. Pray for them. Lord Jesus, I just thank you that someone stepped out of their way to come and find me, to tell me the truth, to witness to me, to tell me the truth of this good news, the freeing of slaves from prison bars. Amen. Mm. You and Gileon. Someone say, you and Gileon. <laughs> Colossians 1.13 says this, He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He has brought us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves, in whom we have redemption. What is that redemption? Comma, the forgiveness of sins. We don't have to be held, we don't have to be held back by those anymore. That's good news. Amen. Glad tidings of salvation through Jesus Christ. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they bring the good news with these feet. They bring it to the Thessalonians. But they're wondering, did the little guy make it? Did he make it? Realistically, how could they make it? Realistically, would they make it? 
Statistically speaking, would these Thessalonians, who we'd only spent three weeks with to get everything we had to get into them, for them to stand against the persecution that was coming against them, would these little guys make it? Here's what I know. Sunlight Ministry says that 65% of incoming freshmen are open to the claims of Christ. 65% are open to the claims of Christ. And by the end of that first semester, it drops to 35%. People can become much more close to the gospel after one semester of college living. Here's what I know, that in, in the fall, in the very first, one of the very first things we do, about 250 people come to a worship on the lawn, right, Sabby? And about 40 to, 35 to 40 people will line up and, say, and walk the line and say, I give my life to Christ. And what I know is that out in January, in this week, only four to five will still be standing with the, with the Lord, will still be standing with Jesus. It reminds me of sea turtles. You guys ever see the sea turtles? Everybody watch a little bit of um, National Geographic? Check out these sea turtles. We got any um, volume? These little sea turtles are just hatching out of their eggs. Oh, look at those cute guys. Aren't they cute? Go, little guy. Go, little guy. Yes! Safety of the sea. Yes! One. One made it. National Geographic says that five out of a hundred, five out of a hundred of these little guys will make it out to the ocean. Here's the crazy thing, y'all. When I watch this video, I don't see turtles. I see, new, I see new believers, Emma. I see college students, Emma. I see, I see 40 <laughs> line up and hatch. And as the semester goes on, boyfriend comes along. Whoosh, party scene comes along. Whoosh, busyness comes along. Whoosh, intramurals come along. Whoosh, Who's left standing? Five out of 100. That's real, y'all. That's real. I think God is reflecting in nature what happens in, in eternity. Amen? Oh, that's dark. Yeah, it's freaking dark. Yeah. Yeah, and one day we're going to stand before the Lord. We're going to see all accounts reconciled, and he'll divide the sheep and the goats. The sheep, the ones who listened and gave their lives to Christ and followed the good news of the gospel. And, and the goats, the ones, he says, I never knew you. And they will have an eternity of darkness. And the gospel is right now. Until death, we have a moment where we can share the good news of what is real with the world around us. Because there is eternal darkness if they don't. That is all there is. There's light and there's darkness. There is heaven and there's hell. That's all there is. There's no purgatory. There's no such thing. It's not in the Bible, y'all. There's no way to work your way up after you die. When you die, what you did in life will echo in eternity. If you did not receive Jesus Christ, if you did not make him the Lord of your life, there is no eternal life for you. John 3.16 says it, man. For, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have ever, everlasting life. And verse 17 says that they have condemned themselves already if they don't receive that truth. It's not comfortable. But I'm not here to put springs on the wagon of life and make you more comfortable. I'm here to tell you the truth, to be a witness of the Evangelion. Amen? Here's what I know. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 says, Man, man, may the Lord make you increase and abound so that, someone say so that, 
he may establish your heart. So he may be he may establish your heart, that you may be established, that you may excel, that you may grow, so that whenever that, that dragon of old comes to drag you into his lair, you are established, and you say, uh-uh, nah, I know how this thing works. I'm not following your deception anymore. Amen. Now Paul, Silas, and Timothy know that, that 1 Corinthians 9 says that, 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 that the only one who wins the prize is the one who finishes the race. The only one who gets to heaven is the one who finishes the race, not the one who started the race and maybe said yes to Jesus and raised their hand, uh, but the one who finishes the race. Uh, and the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, by which you were saved, it says, if, someone say if, you hold fast the word that I, that I preached to you unless you believed in vain, meaning that there is a way that you can believe in vain, that it would be of no good, that you, you, if, you, if you stop believing, if you, if you walk away from the faith, then you have believed in vain. He says, I declare this gospel. That you are saved by this gospel. You stand in this gospel if you hold fast the word that was preached to you to the end, if you make it all the way to the sea. But these missionaries, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they're only with the Thessalon Thessalonians for three weeks. And everything would be great if everything was easy, but no one, when, when no one was beating them up and taking their lunch money, right? When no one was making fun of them for being Christians. When, uh, but the last thing that these new Thessalonian believers saw was their mentors getting beaten up and pushed out of town and, and, and ridiculed and the mob going after them. And they had this moment, maybe, where they're like, man, is this really something I should be doing? Man, do I really want to be involved in a place that gets made fun of all the time? Do I really want to be in involved with this guy who keeps getting thrown in jail all the time. And maybe for a split second they had thought, maybe I should just uh, walk away and forget this whole thing, abandon this whole thing. He says, if you hold fast to the end. Statistically speaking, the odds aren't looking good for these new believers. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are up all night. They're like, man, what happened to the little guys? Did the little turtles make it? Did they make it to the sea or did they get picked off? Were they able to stand firm? Did they cave to the persecution around them? Did they cast off the gospel and go back to their old ways? They're like, oh, I didn't sign up for this. But he tells the Thessalonian believers in 2.1, if you're in chapter 2 with me, say amen. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. We might get beaten up. We might get thrown in jail. We might get whatever. We might be said all kinds of things about us. All kinds of crazy stuff's going to happen, but it was not in vain. It was worth it. Someone say, it was worth it. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, like I talked about a minute ago, thrown in jail, as you know, we had the boldness, even after that, to keep going. Someone almost like, can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> we had the boldness of our God to speak to you the gospel amid much opposition or much conflict. They got beat up and thrown in jail. They could have stopped. It's not fun getting beat up or made fun of, left out. But he says, we were there, but we, in the midst of much opposition, we still brought you the gospel. Are you getting any opposition out there, people? <laughs> uh, fusion leaders, uh, uh, anybody slamming doors in your face and not answering the door and avoiding you because they're gonna, you know, they know you're going to ask them to come to your cell group, right? Uh, yeah, a little bit? Yeah, a little bit there, Carson. That, that's all right. But you had how many show up? Four or five football players show up on Thursday, didn't you? <laughs> and more are coming. Oh, yeah, amid much opposition. Now, RAs, do you ever get, uh, you know, laughed at when you say the word Wesley? Uh, uh, maybe made fun of, like, oh, yeah, you got to get Tuesday off. Oh, you got to get Thursday off. It's like, listen, I'll take all your weekend duties. Just give me Thursday and give me Tuesday. Oh, yeah, 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 you're part of it. Yeah, any, anybody get a little bit of that going on up in there? Is, it, is the Evangelion worth it to you? Is it worth anything to you? He says, our coming to you was not in vain for... Our exhortation, and that word exhortation carries this idea of calling up and calling near, uh, a persuasive discourse, a stirring address, a challenge. It's not soft and nice. Oh, you're fine. It's not the patting on the head. No, exhortation has this other idea of being a little bit more of like a, like, like a football coach. Come on. Come on, Nate Hall. Don't let him get your knees. Don't let him get your knees. Guard those knees. Don't let them get you. You got more in you. Come on. Don't whine about it. Get up. That's, that's what exhortation is. Okay, so, so he says, for our exhortation, exhortation does not come from error. We're not wrong about it. It's not impure uh, or by way of deceit. This calling them up to better things did not come from a place of error or impurity. Verse 4, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel... 
Did you know that you've been entrusted with the gospel? If you're a Christian, if you've given your life to Christ, you are now a witness of the good news of Jesus Christ. And he says here that we, are, we have been entrusted with this. We have been entrusted with this as Christians, not to please people, not to please men. In fact, Galatians 1.10, I'll write that down. The Bible says in Galatians 1.10, if you're trying to please people, then you're not a servant of God. Galatians 1.10, not pleasing men, but God. I'm here to please God. If it makes you mad, I'm sorry, but I'm here to please God. He's my audience of one, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor a pretext or of greed. God's our witness. Nor do we seek to glorify men or seek glory from people, either from you or from anyone else. Even though, as apostles, we might have asserted our authority to be paid to do what we did, we didn't even get paid to do what we did. We did it for free. That's how much we believed in it. All right, let's break this down for just a moment. How did the gospel come to the Thessalonians? How did it not come? It didn't come in error. And that word, I kind of broke it down. It's straying about. It's having a wrong opinion about something. And if you have a wrong opinion about something, if you believe something wrong, it leads to a wrong action. That's error. Uh, Impurity. Uh, it, it breaks down into luxurious living. So they're not coming into town like, I'm going to sit around and you're going to pay me a bunch of money and I'm going to sell you some snake oil. That's not what they were about. It's not impurity. It's no deceit. Deceit would be bait and switch, the idea of bait and switch, where, where you didn't know what you're getting into and I bait and switch you, boom, and now you're like, oh, shoot, well, I guess I have to do this, like a timeshare uh, kind of thing, you know, like where they say, oh, you get a free hotel, you just got to come to an hour meeting and then you buy a timeshare, you know, and it's like, oh, man, what I get myself into? You don't know what I'm talking about. You're too young for that. Um, <laughs> to please people, this one you might understand, telling people what they want to hear because if you tell them the truth, they might not be your friend anymore. With flattering speech, check this out. I did a whole study in my commentary on, on, on throughout the Bible, the word flattery. I went every verse that found, and I looked it up in the Greek and everything. Check out what the word flattery basically means. It's the act of giving excessive compliments to somebody, not for them, but to gain approval or benefit of, of the person giving the flattery. It's, uh, so it's a difference. A compliment is intended to benefit the person that, that's receiving the compliment. But flattery is me complimenting you so that I can get something out of you. So ladies, if a boy is telling you all these nice things about you, just watch out what he's trying to get out of you, okay? Make sure it's a real compliment and not flattery. So I'm ready to say amen. amen. The pretext. And same thing with you guys. I know those girls are just all over you guys. You know, the, no. I don't see what girls see in guys. It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I'm glad God has made you blind. You always see these ugly guys with like really beautiful women. It's like, how did that happen? All of us guys, we know, right? We know what we're talking. You know what I'm talking about, right? And it's like, how did that happen? They're. Bl- I mean, look at Cole. I mean, uh, I mean, how did you? How did you land that? I know. I don't know. And believe it or not, ladies, that's a compliment to a man. The man's like, I know, right? I got that one. Flattering speech. Where are we going? Someone said we're going somewhere. Pretext. Someone say pretext. Pretext is giving a reason that's not the real reason. My son does this to me all the time. He's like, hey, Dad, you know how you really like to do blah, 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 blah? I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. He's like, oh, yeah, well, if we did that, then you could buy me a new video game. Oh, okay. So pretext is trying to say it's one thing when actually you're trying to get something else. He says, we didn't come to you like that. Uh, with greed, we ain't making no money. Coop, do you own a house? Uh, I don't own a house. Tracy, do you own a house? I own like two cars. I don't got any money to my name. Listen, we're not doing this thing for the money, amen? amen. <laughs> we ain't doing this for greed. I didn't get that extra zero after, at the end of my paycheck. He says, we're not doing this for greed. We're not trying to make money off of you. We're just trying to give you the euangelion, How you say that, um, and for the glory of men. You might understand this one, glory of glory of people. Oh, look how amazing they are. Maybe you can get something out of, out of people when you share the gospel. Oh, that guy's the prayer warrior. Oh, ooh, that's the go-to person whenever it comes to this or that. Oh, wow, they really know their... It's really easy, guys, to fall into pride and to try to get glory. Don't do it. Someone say, don't do it. Don't do it. He says in verse 7, that we prove to be gentle among you like a nursing mother tenderly cares 
for her own children. So we didn't come with impurity. We didn't come with deceit. We didn't come here to please people. We didn't come with flattering speech or pretext or greed or for the glory of men. No, we came like a gentle mom, and we tried to, man, we, we nurtured you. Who do you run to when you get hurt? It's your mama. It's not dad, is it? You know, who, who runs to your mama? Run, raise your hand. Come on, be, be honest. with. Who runs to your mama when you need a Band-Aid, right? 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 Just by, this might totally blow it out of the water, but who runs to dad? Anybody run to, okay. He's a nurse. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. A nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. He's like, look, man, we, we could be paid. There's, there's, we're going to talk about that. There's actually a verse that says you, if, you, if you labor in the word, then you deserve to be paid for. But he's like, we're not, I'm not even going to be paid, so you don't think this is about money. I come to bring you the gospel the good news, that you're free, that you don't have to live like that anymore, that you don't have to be a slave anymore. I come to bring you the good news. He says, man, we are gentle like a nursing mother, caring for you, having so fond of an affection for you. We were well pleased to impart not only the gospel of God, but also our whole lives. My whole life is access to you. Our own lives, because you had become what? You had become dear to us. Does this look like it's just a job? Does this look like it's just their vocation? Oh, I'm thinking about getting into ministry. It's nine to five, and I can clock out, and I don't have to talk, be around people, and I just get to tell people what to do. That's not ministry, y'all. If that's the mindset you have of what ministry is, so you guys who are looking to be ministers one day, divorce yourself from that. That's not what ministry is. He says here, we became so fond of you. We became like a nursing mother. We gave you our own lives. You were very dear to us. You mattered to us. I pray for you all the time. For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardships, how working night and day as to not be a burden to any of you. We worked full-time jobs. They were bivocational. They worked full-time jobs so they could proclaim the gospel of God to you at night. Verse 10, you are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you for your sake. Okay, so let's look at that. I already covered the full-time job. Their devotion. Check this out. They were devoted speaks to their passion and their belief that the, this is the words of God. It's so important that this is not a side gig. This is not a side mission. This is the main quest. And I will do it for free if I have to because this is how important it is. They were so devoted that they did it for free. Uh, upright, and, and upright behavior among them. We were upright in our behavior to, uh, among you guys. There was no inconsistencies between their words, their thoughts, their feelings, and their actions. They loved these people. Blamelessly, there was no foul motives in these apostles. Verse 11, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring you as a father would his own children. So check this out. Uh, back whenever Macy was uh, in grade school, we had this bring your dad to school day. And uh, so all of us dads come to school. You know, most times dads, we don't know what we're doing. We're like, uh, what'd your mom say? Well, then do that. Okay. Uh, well, did your mom say you can play video games? Okay, then you can play video games, right? Like dads are like, oh, we do. go get the milk. Uh, one night I was um, uh, mixing up milk for Macy when she was a little baby, like a little baby. And uh, I forgot to screw the lid on, right? And so I'm, and I'm like this guy that's like, I'm out of it. And I'm like, oh, I'm like getting the formula. I'm shaking it up and everything. And, and, I, and I go to like back to, to bed and I'm just going to like put it in her mouth and, and it just dumps in her face. <laughs> And her eye sockets are full of milk, and she's like, oh, oh. I mean, I'm like Guantanamo Bay, like waterboarding my kid with like milk. And Carrie wakes up and she goes, Why did you do that? And I said, Because I wanted to drown my kid, Carrie. I was trying to get some information out of her. She might be a terrorist. I didn't mean to. Listen, dads don't know what we're doing, we don't know what we're doing. We're just kind of going, so, so we're all going to this thing at Macy's school, you know, and all the other dads like, what are you doing here? I'm a dad. What are you doing? I'm a dad. Hi. I'm a dad too. I guess that it makes me something here. And we walk in and the teacher begins to tell us this crazy story. I wish I knew where it was from. I wish I remember who it was, but she told us this story of this Ivy League school. I believe it was Princeton or Yale. I can't remember. It's one of those two. And she said they did this study where they took a toy and they put it at the top of the stairs. And they would take the mom in and, and see how the mom would react with this toddler. So the toddler, so she would go up the stairs. Oh, I'll be careful. I'll be careful. Oh, don't, oh, don't be, be careful. Okay, good job. Right? 
And then the dads would come in, and they were not around the moms. The dad would stand down at the bottom and be like, you got this, come on. I ain't going up there. You go. No, don't. Go. You got this. Don't be afraid. Don't look, don't look at me. You look up there. Go. Do this. You got this. You are a warrior. You can do this. You can do this. Go. Don't you, don't you cry. If I come up there, mmm. And they would get the toy. Here's the beautiful thing about the design of God. That we would have a nurturing mother in our family that would, if you get hurt, you go to mom. And you would have an imploring father that would say, you're better than that. Rise up, son. Go on. Come back with your shoulder on it. Right? Like, go on. Be a man. Right? Or woman. <laughs> be a warrior. Right? And that's the beauty. And that's also why the devil is attacking the family unit to try to make fatherless homes so that you'll just always go back to safety or to get a mom out of the picture so that you just become hardened. It takes both, guys. And that's why I want you to change family lines out there. Divorce, take it out of your vocabulary. We don't even know that word. I don't even know what it means. We, we don't even say that. We don't joke about it. We don't talk about it. It's not even an option. It never was. When we said our ideas, that was it. I want you to do the same. Amen? Okay. I'm diverging. Here we go. He says, we were like a mother that, that nurtured you, and we were like a father imploring you like I would my own kids. Why? Verse 12 says, so that. Someone say, so that. so that. What does so that mean? It's a term of conclusion, right? Remember this. I'm giving you a little hermeneutics. So that is a term of conclusion. Why would he do all this? So that, a term of conclusion. Here we go. Really big. Boom, boom, boom. So that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his kingdom and glory, meaning you can walk worthy. Amen? You've been fed some bull, saying, oh, you'll never be worthy. You can't be worthy. You're not worthy. And I'm saying, why would it say that you could walk worthy? He's, we, we implored you so that you could walk worthy of the God who calls you. And we're going to unpack that here in a few weeks, what that means. Verse 13, for this reason, we also constantly thank God, man, we are praying for you. That, and we thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, that you accepted it, not as the words of men, but what it really is, the words of God, which also performs this good work in you who believe. The gospel works. Amen? It does the heavy lifting. I could tell you story after story about how the gospel just works in a time when it shouldn't. That seed sprouts up in some kind of crazy place in the middle of concrete. And you're like, how did that happen? The gospel works. Verse 14. For you, brethren, became imitators of us. This is how we know it works. You became imitators of our tupos, our impression, our, our uh, imprint. You became imitators of the churches of God in, of, in Christ Jesus in Judea. For, and the way we know that is because you endured the same kind of sufferings at the hands of your countrymen, just like they did at the hands of their countrymen. And we got the word hinder twice in the next several verses. One time, the Jews or the unbelieving people in that town tried to hinder them from preaching the gospel so that people would get saved. Later, we see the, the word hinder again. You can look at it later when you get home. And it's when the, Satan tried to hinder Paul, Silas, and Timothy from getting to the Thessalon Thessalonians because he, they would come and establish them in their faith. And the devil didn't want that to happen. He wanted to keep them as baby so that he could pick them off like a seagull. Amen? Where God is working to bring the life-saving message of the gospel, there will always be strong opposition. Amen? If you are encountering strong opposition that you're not bringing on yourself, that means you are doing a good thing. Amen? Because if you're preaching the gospel, you will get opposition. There will be backlash. There will be people that make fun of you and keep you out of the reindeer games if you're doing it right. Amen? You're coming at them you're bringing the good news. You're going all the way to Galveston. You're not stopping up at Amarillo. You're going all the way down. Amen? There will always be strong opposition. Verse 19. This is probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible right now. For who is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? What do we look forward to? What gets us up? What puts a bounce in our step? Why do I get up in the morning? Is it not even you? In the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. What gets me out of bed? What, man, I, I couldn't do anything else but bring the life-saving message of the Evangelion to the world. It's to see you in heaven, y'all. It's to see you make it out to the ocean, to make, see you make it, to get out there, 
to have a family, to have kids that you raise in the goodness of God, who, to, to, to raise their kids in the goodness of God, to transform the world around you, to be transformed, to love God and to enjoy him forever. That's what gets me up in the morning, is that one day we're going to walk across that line. It's the real deal, man. We're going to actually see Jesus face to face. We're going to look him in the eye and be like, oh my goodness. And about the next thing is you look to the right. Maybe you look to your left and you see the people that you led to the Lord. Oh my goodness, how great is that? And you say, you made it, Tanner, you made it, man. Byron, you, you made it, man. You made it all the way to the ocean. Wow. And it'll be the most amazing thing that we can't even explain on this side of heaven. He says, what is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord at his coming? Man, verse, we, we jump down to chapter 3, verse 2. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's, and for God's service, to do what? To strengthen and to encourage you in your faith, to establish you, some translations say. And the word establish means to set up on a firm foundation or permanent foundation. By the time you are established, no seagull can get you. In that first two years of your life, I'm just throwing out two years usually, Man, those seagulls are coming after you. There is everything, and, and it, it's getting thrown at you. And offenses, you get offended at your pastor. You get offended at your friends. You get offended at this or that, and it's just like that, and you get snapped up. Man, but once you get established, you learn how to forgive. And you learn how you, oh, I know this is just another trick of the devil trying to get me off my game. Listen, I, I sent Timothy to establish you, to set you up with a good foundation. The gospel works. Mm. To encourage you, verse 3, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials because they're watching Paul and Silas and Timothy get beat up and chased out of town. And, and he says, man, we don't want you to be unsettled because we're going through this. For you know quite well that we were destined for this. We were supposed to get beat up. In fact, verse 4, uh, when we were with you, we kept telling you that, this is, this is, that we would be persecuted. That, and it turned out that way, as you know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith to see how you were doing, little turtles. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you that our labors then would become in vain because the tempter got you and gobbled you up. They're on pins and needles. Why would Timothy need to establish them in their faith? Because it's possible to start this race and not finish it. Because you are saved if you hold fast to the end. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. Because there are hundreds of hindrances and things to try to stop you from making it out to sea. And once you are a full-grown sea turtle, those seagulls can't get you. And once you are established, the enemy has a much harder time killing you. But if, you, if, he, if, he, if he can destroy you as a baby, as a new believer, as a young Christian, if he can take you out then like he tried to do with Moses, like he tried to do with Jesus 2,000 years later, like he's trying to do through abortions today. 2,000 years, 2,000 years, 2,000 years. Isn't that interesting? That's another sermon for another day. If he can take you out while you're young and small and a baby, then he doesn't have to worry about you growing up, i.e. the whole meaning of Terminator 1. Anybody see Terminator 1? We've got to go back and kill John Connor before he, you know, while he's a baby so that we don't have to wait for him to become a warrior and fight him then. That's the same thing that the devil tries to do with you, to snatch you up when you're young. But guys... You can go through being born again and hatching from your egg and learning to crawl in the faith and learning to, to swim in community with all these other nice little turtles only to go out there on your own when you graduate and get picked off if you haven't established yourself in your faith. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are on pins and needles. Did the little guys make it? Verse 6. Yes, they did. Timothy has just now come to us and told us, and he's brought us good news of your faith and love. Paul. What in your ever-loving mind would make you want to do such a thing? Give your life away like that, to be beat up all the time, do all those things? I, man, just looking at this guy, I'm like, what is in your head, man? Silas, why would you leave the comforts of home back in Judea and your friend group and, and your great, you know, you had a whole couples group there that you were hanging out with, a good Sunday school class, and you're going to go out to Europe where people don't even know the name of Jesus, and you're going to do what with them? And they're going to beat you up for it, and you're going to give up all your free time to join the lead team? What? Why would you do that, Silas? Timothy, why would you throw your future away, man? You had a full ride to Corinth. You football scholarship they're paying for everything you're gonna play for the you know the greek gods team it was it was gonna be great and here you are giving it all away so you can go around with this crazy guy that keeps getting thrown in jail why why would you do that paul Silas, and timothy would look right back at you and say because of you 
because of you. And here's what he says in verse 20. Indeed, you, you are our glory and our joy. You're why I do it. Otherwise, I would have just gone to heaven whenever I got saved, but instead I turned back around and I said, you, that's why. The movie uh, Tortured for Christ is on Amazon Prime, if you have it. It's a story of Richard Wormbrandt, who was a Roman Lutheran priest who had worked within the underground church of Romania until, it was taken, until Romania was taken over by the communists in 1944. He was tortured because he was a pastor and because he led people to Jesus and he got caught and they put him in this, in this horrible cell and they would beat him every day for 14 years. And he wouldn't change his mind. He wouldn't change his tune. He kept on bringing the Evangelion to the people. And he said this. He said, he said, it was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever got caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. We were, we were, we accept, so we accepted the communist terms. It was a deal. We preached and they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy beating us. Everyone was happy. How much is the Evangelion worth to you? They caught, if they caught you praying, they would torture you and to teach you a lesson. And they would come by at 10 o'clock p.m. every night and to, for lights out. And they, if they caught you praying, you would go to the cell and they would beat you severely. And every night at 10 o'clock, Richard Warmbrandt would be on his knees praying. And the guard would come in and beat him. And at first he's smiling. And years later, he's not smiling anymore. Finally, he gets mad. And Wormbrandt's got blood all over his face. And the way that the scene goes is um, the guard, and it's a true story, um, 10 o'clock, he comes. He says, pray? Praying again? Are you serious? What could you possibly be praying for? Your wife is in a prison camp. Your son is an orphan. What could you possibly be praying for? Richard said, you. I was praying for you. Just now, it's just praying for you. Wow. I'm sorry, I can't stop. I won't stop. You can't get me to stop. You're going to have to kill me because I ain't going to stop. Verse 7. Yeah, we went through all of that. But guess what, guys? We were encouraged because of your faith. For now, this is my favorite verse, verse 8. For now we really live, man, since you are standing in the Lord. Now we really live if you stand fast in the Lord. You know what my greatest joy is, is watching you walk in the Lord. That's my greatest joy. Carry me. That's why we do what we do. You know, my greatest heartache is watching you walk away from the Lord. Stand. Be established. Make it to the sea. Do what you got to do. Change the world. Be transformed. God is giving you freedom. Now we really live. Real life isn't making more money, guys, or getting that 2.5 kids or the white picket fence or all the things when your friends are buying big houses and you go to buy a big house and when they have kids, all of a sudden you start having kids. That's not life. That's part of life. But the real life is seeing the light bulb come on because I'm telling you what's seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 4. Real life is seeing the light bulb come on in somebody. Real joy is seeing God, like leading somebody to Jesus, amen? Real joy is seeing someone get it for the first time, seeing the turtle make it to the sea, seeing it work, seeing them live, seeing eternal life. Guys, this isn't just a job. This isn't just a career. This isn't just a vocation. This is a calling, amen? And every one of us have it, the Evangelion. We all have it inside of us. This, this, we have been impacted by Jesus, and therefore we now must go into all the world and preach the gospel. 2.8, let's make a list of it. 2.8 says, we, are, we not only gave you the gospel, we gave you our own lives. That's, um, that's, if you want to be a minister, do that. Uh, you became dear to us. We had fond affection for you. We nurtured you like a nursing mother like family. We implored you like a father, like family, like our own children. Who is our hope? Who is our joy? Who is our crown of rejoicing? You are. You are our glory and our joy, and now we really live if we see you walking in the Lord. That's what it means to walk out your calling, whether you're a school teacher or a doctor or anything else. Worship team, you can come. Missionary Jim Elliott 
a man who gave his life to make sure the Wadani tribe down in Ecuador heard the gospel. They were killing each other out, spearing each other to death, and, and they, were, they were coming to extinction. And he heard about the Wadani tribe who no missionary could get close to them because they're so violent and so dangerous. He found a way to make contact with them, him and his four buddies, Jim Elliott. And he goes to make contact with them, and they, they, they mistake him for a, a threat, and they spear him and his four friends to death. His wife and all the men's wives could have gone home back to the United States, but instead they stayed. And they go back to the village that, and the very people that murdered their husbands, and they give them the Evangelion. Those people end up getting saved, and the guy who killed Jim Elliot becomes a father figure to Jim Elliot's son. Jim Elliot, before he died, said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Give your life away. What is life? What is joy? Helping other people. It's so much about others. So many times we come to college and we want to get something, get more zeros after our paycheck or whatever it may be. But real life is giving your life away. The Bible says the God so loved that he gave. It says, if you give, it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be given back to your soul. So if you want to get life, give it away.